end of my line. Sure. Then I found out it was all on my mind. What? That's why I'm here to end out a field. We all gon' die. All right, what are the Young Turks? Uh, explosive show today. Let's start it right away. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yeah. Down goes McChrystal. It appears down goes McChrystal. And I don't know that we wanted to get him, but we got him. And it looks like he got himself more than anything else. General McChrystal, uh, in charge of the troops in Afghanistan, involved in a, a profile piece in Rolling Stone, which turned out to be nothing but disastrous. Iceberg straight ahead. And he ran right into it. I, I mean, in military terms and in PR terms, you cannot get a bigger epic fail. What the hell was he thinking? So what, what's the piece and what's happened as a result? First article comes out uh, where he throws every single person in the chain of command underneath him. Almost. He didn't say anything bad about Mullen, okay, who's the, his uh, direct, uh, of course, the top of the chain in terms of Joint Chiefs, right, head of the Joint Chiefs. So uh, let's get to it. First of all, Joe Biden, one of his uh, officers with him, uh, that he allowed to be interviewed throughout this whole uh, article uh, calls Joe Biden, Joe bite me. Okay. And they say that he's clueless and doesn't know anything about Afghanistan and isn't right at all. Uh, they think uh, the, na our uh, Jim Jones, who's the head of the National Security Council, is a clown stuck in 1985. Uh, he says the Obama gave him an, quote, unsellable position questions Obama throughout the piece uh, and you know Eikenberry the the head of uh, our diplomatic uh, corps of course in Afghanistan says that he uh, Eikenberry betrayed him and that he has the worst relations with him when you get to Holbrook uh, one of our top diplomats in the region that Obama sent specifically to control the situation there he says he just gets in the way he gets a a, uh, a message for him while the reporter is there and he's like oh, I don't want to answer this and basically says he's a pain in his ass and he's just trying to meddle in his affairs and doesn't know what he's doing and he's desperate I mean it goes on and on you're like Jesus how did you let this stuff into print because look if you do that you're putting the president in a situation where he has to either fire you because you've thrown everybody under the bus or I guess you think maybe the president is so weak that you could bully him and that he'll even take that. I mean, this is Dr. David D. Schultz on John Stoss. And that's an open-handed slap, boy. What are you going to do about it? And I, I, can't, I can't imagine that Obama would be weak enough to not fire him, right? Right? Well, as I told you in the beginning, we now have a report, as we're doing this show live, that uh, McChrystal has offered to resign now that doesn't mean he has resigned it doesn't mean Obama has accepted that resignation but it would be very surprising if he didn't because you just can't do a public rebuke like this of the president and and his entire staff and everybody else working in Afghanistan and get away with it because what does that tell the rest of the military oh you can ignore the commander-in-chief I mean that doesn't just endanger our uh, mission in Afghanistan or in the region it endangers our chain of command that the commander in chief is even though he's a civilian is in charge so I, I don't think Obama has a choice here uh, McChrystal's got to go the next question is what was he thinking I mean as I keep reading this I'm like I don't what is it I and I felt like I had an obligation to figure it out before I, I came on the show today so I tried to read as much background as I could on it. Of course, I read the whole article, and I tried to see what the, the motivations and the spin of the writer is, the motivation and the spin of McChrystal's aides, McChrystal himself. Because So here are some possibilities. One, he got so cocky, he was so above the law, that he thought, oh, this Obama kid's a pushover, man. He said at one point in the piece that Obama seemed intimidated by the military brass in the room uh, when they were together. He says Obama didn't spend much time with him and didn't, a didn't know anything about him, didn't ask him the relevant questions. That almost paints Obama in a Bush-like uh, role, which, again, I can't. it's crazy, right? Even if you think that stuff, 
which is entirely possible. By the way, don't get me wrong. C could does, do people think about this stuff about all one another? Of course. I'm sure Jim Jones thinks McChrystal's a clown and Eikenberry's a clown and, and Eikenberry thinks Holbrook's a clown and Biden's a clown. Well, I'm sure, but they don't go and put it in the press. So it was it overwhelming cockiness? Maybe. Or maybe subconsciously or consciously he thought, you know what? I got to go, man. This thing's unwinnable. I got to get out of here. So he either on purpose or, like I said, subconsciously threw himself onto the bus. This is an easy way to get fired and, you know, get a one-way ticket out of Afghanistan, which ain't working out. That's the other sense you get from the Rolling Stone article as you read it. You think, oh, wow, no, 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 we got no shot at this thing. I mean, the troops don't believe it. The troops are not behind McChrystal. Uh, and that actually goes to McChrystal's credit. L l I'll explain that in a second, okay? But uh, the commanders don't seem to think, even McChrystal's team, who are so gung-ho, they don't seem to believe they can win. Uh, it's not clear that the administration thinks they can win, so who thinks they can win, and why are we there? And that's a, thing, a theme that keeps coming up throughout the article. And so, look, a very important thing for you to understand is the motivation of the writer. We always talk about that here because is it a prepared leak? Why are they getting this piece, etc.? No, the writer appears to like McChrystal uh, for what that's worth, right? And at the same time, he realizes he's sitting on something explosive and he definitely wants it to get out to press. They don't even tell the White House. They don't ask for confirmation or anything like that from the White House because they don't want the White House to get a hold of it and then kill, spike the piece, right? So they're like, yeah, 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 it's cool. Oh, look at that, it already appeared online. What can you do, right? But, they, but here's the interesting part. They double-checked and triple-checked with their sources, their editors did, to make sure that everything in the article was right. So they, that means they go back to McChrystal's aides who said these devastating things, and some of which McChrystal himself said. And they say, did you really call, say Joe Biden's Joe bite me? They go, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Go ahead and print it. So then that doesn't even seem subconscious, right? That seems pretty clear intent. Third possibility is, look, McChrystal thought that this situation was not going to work out, right? He's not going to get the glorious win that he wanted. And if Obama fires him, and in the meanwhile, he's throwing Obama and everybody else on, on that team under the bus, I, look, I'm grasping his straws because it's so irrational. Maybe he comes out and says, maybe he did it because he thinks, oh, I come out and I run against him. I'm the, you know, genius military general that he fired. I become, you know, like when uh, Truman fired MacArthur, I become, on my generation's MacArthur, get a, you know, a grandiose view of himself. I go to the Republicans and I say, oh, I know how they screwed this thing up, man. And then, you know, and then, well, look at this. They fired me for political reasons, for PR reasons. And they didn't care about the counterinsurgency. And uh, they didn't care about the war, the mission. They cared more about PR. I, is, maybe that's the way he goes. Everybody's talking about how Petraeus might run against Obama at some point, or might run as a Republican. Maybe it's McChrystal. All right, now, what kind of guy is McChrystal? Now, in the article, uh, they, the writer says over and over again, maybe, Nearly half a dozen times, he calls him either a badass or an ass kicker, or he always kicks ass. And he apparently carries around nunchucks with his name on it and like four stars for his four stars. And constantly quotes Bruce Lee. But that's not badass, that's infantile. I mean, what is General Crystal? He's going to get like an a Afghani warlord and he's going to be like, boom. It's ridiculous. That's asinine, if you ask me. Anyway. But, but the writer seems enamored with him, and he's a tough guy, and he's brilliant. He gets the brilliant adjective two or three times in the article. Uh, and so the, the writer is not against him. But when you look at the, the specifics, but don't get me wrong, uh, the article was very balanced, and, and not in a bad way, in a good way. They said, look, he's a badass, he's brilliant, et cetera, which I don't necessarily agree with. But then he'd come back and say, but here are McChrystal's downsides, and here's what he did wrong. And he did a good job pointing that out. So... Remember the, the background of McChrystal. Uh, this is the guy uh, that uh, did the Pat Tillman cover. I mean, or, be, but before that, you know who he was? We've talked about this before, and this is why I had my doubts about McChrystal. He was what 
Rumsfeld and Bush thought were, quote, the golden boy. He was Rumsfeld's golden boy. Initially, he did, I mean, so you know he knows PR. He was our PR guy in Iraq. So when Bush said mission accomplished, the guy who backed him up was McChrystal. He came out and said, oh, yeah, no, Bush is absolutely right. The mission was totally accomplished. The combat operations are over. Shut up. And when Rumsfeld said about the breakout of civil war and insurgency, et cetera, stuff happens, who backed him up? McChrystal. McChrystal said, yeah, absolutely. What are you talking about? Stuff happens all the time. How can you deny that? Uh, and, uh, you know, and on and on it goes. And whenever they needed somebody to cover for them, McChrystal was there. Now, the Tillman case is the perfect example of that. So Pat Tillman uh, dies by friendly fire. Uh, it's already obvious. They write a report about it. McChrystal says, no, it wasn't friendly fire. I'm going to nominate him from Silver Star. He, he was heroically killed in the line of battle fighting uh, Af Afghan terrorist insurgents. Later, he goes on to say, well, I didn't read it that carefully. As the writer of the piece explains, not likely. He's a guy who is very much uh, into the details. He's not a guy who's detached from the specifics of any issue. Besides which, this is the most important report he's going to write in his career. And he didn't read things properly? At the very least, that's gross negligence. But, it's, but anyway, that's not debatable. Because a week later, he writes an email to the White House saying, hey, make sure to tell the president, don't talk about the specifics of how Tillman died, because it might be embarrassing later. So he 100% knew that he was killed by friendly fire and wrote the exact opposite. How he survived that? Well, he survived it because he was Rumsfeld and, and Bush's golden boy. And they kept promoting him up and up and up. Look, this is what drives me crazy about Obama. It goes back to the same exact thing. Why did he put in charge of Afghanistan the most important conflict for him? He says Afghanistan is his top priority. He does, does a surge, increases the number of troops going to Afghanistan twice over. And the one guy he picks is Bush's golden boy. Why did you do that? And then, remember why McChrystal had controversy surrounding him in the first place. Before the latest surge that Obama ordered, McChrystal publicly uh, embarrassed the president. Came out and said, look, uh, if we don't get uh, the 40,000 troops, uh, we're going to lose this war, and it's going to be the administration's fault. I, I said at the time, well, you got to fire the guy. I mean, who do you think leaked that? He leaked it. It's super obvious who leaked it. So are you going to allow that kind of insubordination? And what happened? Obama allowed it, and it encouraged McChrystal to do more. See, that's what I'm telling you. If Obama keeps bowing his head to the right wing, whether it's in the military or in politics, he's going to keep getting smacked down. They don't, they don't look at that as like, oh, Obama's doing us a favor. They look at it as like, ah, Obama's weak. I can spit on him and get away with it. So, so as I tell you this story, I think probably the most likely reason McChrystal did this was he thought Obama's such a pushover that I could say anything. I spit in his eye before, and then he gave me exactly what I wanted. He gave me 30,000 more troops. Maybe if I spit in his eye again, he'll give me more of what I want. We'll stay in Afghanistan longer, and I'll get more troops. You know what? Looking at the past, maybe he wasn't that crazy to think that. Well, it didn't work out that way for him, because now everybody's enraged. Now, before I get to the rage and we got quotes and clips, et cetera, for you, I mentioned earlier the troops are, are not behind McChrystal's counterinsurgency program. That actually goes, to, and I said it goes to the credit of McChrystal. Why? See, the, the maddening thing about McChrystal is it's not black and white. I mean, if it was, I'd be dead set against them from the get-go, right? And, and, oh, by the way, he also authorized torture in 2006 in Iraq. A and... He says, oh, I don't know anything about that. But you got commanders that were there saying, no, he would regularly tour the prisons. Later, when he got transferred to Afghanistan and being head of Afghanistan, he said, I don't want to deal with detainee issues. That's a, quote, political swamp. No, not don't torture them. I just don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it because that can get me in political trouble. So this political savvy guy, this PR savvy guy is going to do this accidentally? It doesn't make any sense. So now, anyway, why do the troops not like him? Because he tells them, look, we're not just going to go in guns blazing. We're not going to just kick down doors. We're not going to do nighttime raids. We're not going to do this. We're not going to do that because we've got to win hearts and minds. On that, McChrystal's right. When I look at his core strategy in Afghanistan, you know, if we have any chance at all, it would be to do that plan. To be honest with you, that's my opinion. Okay? And 
but that endangers the troops' lives more, so they get really frustrated. And, you know, t again, to McChrystal's credit, he'll go and talk to the troops pretty openly, and he will allow them to, to talk back to him and to give their real input, and oftentimes they're telling him, hey, look, you're getting us killed out here because you're telling us we can't shoot somebody unless we see a gun. But that, you know, a lot of times you don't see the gun first, and that puts our lives in greater danger. Yeah, they're right, but McChrystal's right. I mean, you can't just shoot people if you don't see guns. Yeah, okay, that means you take a little bit more risk, but that's, that's why I would say as a commander, that's the job you signed up for. And as McChrystal says over and over, if you kill one civilian, you're going to create ten new enemies. It's not the way to win. So that's why it's, it's you know, I haven't been dismissive of McChrystal because I think his core strategy is not a bad one. Ultimately, Afghanistan is likely to be unwillable no matter what, and apparently McChrystal recognizes that. But having said that, you know, between the troops and him, I, I think he's got the right strategy, and I think he's right to stay tough on that. Now, we'll see what happens if the president accepts his resignation. Fascinating day, man. That's why I love doing the news. All right, now, let's take a little bit of a break here. Let's come back. We'll give you some of Robert Gibbs quotes to let you know that the president is very likely to accept that resignation. Come right back. And I'm feeling the strain. All right, back on the Young Turks. Uh, we got to spend a little bit more time on this McChrystal news because this is a bombshell, and, uh, and I'm a little blown away by it. All right, now, here's some of the reactions. Obama spokesperson Robert Gibbs said that, quote, the magnitude and the greatness of this mistake here are profound. Uh, Robert Gates, who's, of course, the uh, defense secretary, said McChrystal made a, quote, significant mistake. And uh, when Gibbs was asked whether the president was angry, he said, or how angry the president was, he said, you would know it if you saw it. Uh, now, we've got more from Gibbs. Let's go to clip number three. What is the president's reaction to the incendiary comments by General, General McChrystal and his aides, and, and has the president spoken to the general about this yet? The president has, uh, has not spoken with uh, General McChrystal. As Secretary Gates' statement says, uh, he was uh, recalled back to Washington to speak to Pentagon officials and to the president about uh, the remarks that were made in that article. What about the president's personal reaction? What is it? Well, uh, Ben, suffice to say, the, uh, uh, our combatant commander does not usually uh, participate in these meetings from Washington. Uh, the president has, the president uh, asked for him to come back to explain uh, those remarks, and uh, that's what he's on his way to do. So, uh, McChrystal got called back into the White House uh, to discuss what was going on here. Now, the latest news is that Joe Klein report, is reporting that McChrystal has offered his resignation. He had earlier said that he had submitted his re resignation, which is different. Apparently, he has not yet submitted his resignation. Offering his verbal submitting is, okay, here's my letter. I've made up my mind. I'm submitting it into you. Now, it, again, according to the latest reports, as we are live on air now, is that Obama will probably make a decision tomorrow on whether he's fired. But the more we do this, and I'm going to give you quotes, more quotes from the article in a second, the more you think, where's the question? <laughs> and that's what the press corps is also asking. Let's go to clip number four. In the story, uh, McChrystal or his aides are quoted as ripping on the president, the vice president, uh, Eikenberry Holbrook. Mm -hmm. How can the president keep someone in his job who offers that level of insubordination? Does he plan to fire him? Well, let me say first and foremost, uh, there are more than 90,000 of our bravest men, men and women in Afghanistan. And what we owe them uh, is nothing for, uh, short of our full support and our best efforts to get a new strategy in that country right. Uh, that's the president's focus. That should be everybody's focus. Uh, no, no, let me, let me finish by saying that, uh, again, the, the president uh, uh, will speak with General McChrystal uh, about his comments, and uh, we'll have more to say um, after that meeting. Is McChrystal's job safe? Uh, we'll have more to say after that meeting. Does the president consider 
the remarks in the story from General McChrystal and his aides in subordination? Uh, I think the President is looking forward to speaking with uh, General McChrystal about those remarks. Can you characterize at all the President's reaction to uh, hearing that aides of McChrystal called Vice President Biden bite me? McChrystal advisor said Obama clearly didn't know anything about McChrystal when they first met. Here's a guy who's going to run his effing war. He didn't seem very engaged. The boss was pretty disappointed. He'll have his undivided attention tomorrow. <laughs> uh, that was a nice little line at the end by Gibbsy. Okay. Uh, so now the guy who wrote the article is Michael Hastings. Let me go through some of the article for you and give you even more details. Um, at one point in the beginning of the article, McChrystal is uh, in France and he's trying to get the French on our side, right? And he's trying to get them more engaged in Afghanistan. They're already on our side, but he wants them to keep troops there. Now the rest of the Europeans are bailing because they're losing elections based on staying in Afghanistan. So he's supposed to do a charm offensive. He doesn't like it, and he tells the reporter over and over how much he doesn't like uh, trying to convince the French to be on our side. And uh, the reporter says, uh, who's he going to dinner with? He asks one of his aides. And one of his aides tells the reporter, some French minister, it's fucking gay. Now, wait a minute. They double-checked that quote. So you know that's going to go out into the press. Now, how is that going to help us with our French allies? Okay, you know, look, am I surprised the guy says that in private? No. And do I even care that he says it in private? Hell no, okay? But you can't say it in public for obvious reason, because those are the gay guys you're trying to convince to stay with you in Afghanistan, <laughs> using your stupid language. All right. Uh, he, McChrystal dismissed the counterterrorism strategy advocated by Vice President Joe Biden as, quote, short-sighted. Now, after he, McChrystal had done his initial leak uh, that pressured Obama into doing what McChrystal wanted, the reporter explains there was a very clear message from the White House and from the Pentagon. I'm quoting the reporter here. Shut the fuck up and keep a lower profile. Does this sound like he's shutting the fuck up and keeping a lower profile? So uh, he's obviously smeared in somebody's face. Um, he said, uh, now his advisor had called Biden, bite me. Uh, McChrystal himself in the piece says, are you asking about Vice President Biden? Who's that? Uh, second in charge of the country? I don't know. Your boss in a lot of ways? That, that's who it is, even if you disagree with him. Crazy to say this stuff in public. Uh, going further, he says, oh, about that meeting with Obama. He called it a, in the initial uh, meeting that they had, he called it a 10-minute photo op and said he did, Obama didn't seem to be very engaged. Okay, how do you put that in the paper and not expect the president to get upset about that? And why do you put it in the paper? That's the key question. Uh, he says, Obama, uh, the reporter explains at the end of all this talking to McChrystal and, the, and his aides that uh, Obama, ver it was, quote, Obama versus the Pentagon and the Pentagon was uh, determined to kick the president's ass. Okay, now that's not a direct quote from any of the McChrystal guys, but that's how he's framing this. So now the question is to Obama, are you going to let them kick your ass? Again, where's the question? Another interesting part of this is that the guys, his aides throughout this, they call him Team America, there's some special operations guys, there's uh, former British special forces, etc. You know, these top military guys that are part of McChrystal's team. They jokingly call themselves Team America after the South Park movie. Okay? But what's interesting is they're drinking wildly throughout everything. Like they take a bus ride to Berlin, right? And they won't stop drinking. Like I'd like I mean I get it, military, yeah, blow some steam off, I'm with you, right? But I'd like them to be sober every once in a while. <laughs> See, I, I'm I was maybe I'm incredibly naive, but I was a a little surprised by the degree of drinking. Here's another thing I was surprised by. Uh, the one person they like, Hillary Clinton. That's interesting. They said, quote, Hillary had Stan's back during the strategic review. She said, if Stan wants it, give him what he needs. Maybe we shouldn't have voted for Hillary after all. <laughs> okay, so that is not, to me, that's not a good sign for Hillary Clinton. Even Team McChrystal privately acknowledged that Karzai, this is now getting to, the, uh, of course, the leader of Afghanistan, is less than an ideal partner. Now, this is an interesting viewpoint, not into McChrystal and Obama, but in Afghanistan. Um, McChrystal is the one guy who's been courting Karzai. 
So Karzai doesn't like any of the other guys, but he likes McChrystal. In fact, this thing blows up, and Karzai immediately issues a press release saying uh, that McChrystal's the best commander he's ever seen. Okay? Um, because McChrystal's had his back all along. But even McChrystal's guys say he's not, he's a less than ideal partner. And quote, he's been locked up in his palace the past year. Now McChrystal's about to do some massive engagement. He goes and he's got to talk to Karzai and get his approval. They say, oh yeah, yeah, the president is uh, not feeling well. He's taking a nap. And tick tock, tick tock, three hours later he's still taking a nap. And they won't wake him. No, no, no. Karzai, there's something wrong. Okay, all those reports about how he might be high or something. At first I thought, hey, you know, it depends on whose agenda it is, who's leaking that, etc. But reading this, these are pro Karzai guys, and they say they can't get in touch with him, and he's holed up in his uh, palace for a year and doesn't come out. No, Karzai's a disaster. The whole Afghanistan war is a disaster. The more you read this article, the more you think, we got to go, we got to get out of there. Okay, there's no one who believes we can win. All right. Um, now, he also, uh, again, the writer explains, Michael Hastings explains that um, McChrystal, his whole career has pushed the envelope. And he says, quote, he knowing precisely how far he could go in a rigid military hierarchy without getting tossed out. So why is he doing this if he knows how to push the envelope? It seems like it's him saying, well, I got away with it last time. Let me push it again and see what happens. So uh, then, um, oh, by the way, you know, I told you that Tillman story, Pat Tillman story, and how he covers it up and tells the president, hey, don't say anything about how he died. You'll get embarrassed later. Wink, wink. So instead of the president, Bush at the time, of course, getting the report and going, oh, this guy lied about the Silver Star. That's ridiculous. No, nine days after uh, that report was filed, McChrystal was promoted to major general. See, that's how things work. Especially that's how things worked in the Bush administration. And by the way, that's not how they should work now. But uh, unfortunately, Obama also promoted McChrystal. By the way, the camp where in Iraq that uh, McChrystal was in charge of where they did the detainee abuse was Camp uh, Nama in Iraq. And um, now, a, a lot of times he talks about how, hey, look, we can't go knocking down doors, as I told you earlier. In fact, he even wanted to create an award for, quote, Cora courageous restraint, which seems hard, but I like the idea, right? But on the other hand, um, he tells a group of special forces units going out at night. He says, go take down, you know, four or five uh, different uh, targets tonight. That's fine. That's their objective. He says, quote, I'm going to have to scold you in the morning for it, though. In other words, don't worry about what I'm saying publicly. Go do whatever the hell you want. And in the morning, I'll say, tut, tut, tut. And at night, I'll let you do it again. In fact, when you look at the numbers, in the first four, four months of this year, NATO forces killed some 90 civilians. Now you might say, well, it depends relative to what? Well, that's up 76% from the same period in 2009. Now that's partly because they're doing more you know, engagement in Afghanistan, more fighting, but it's maybe also because he's not as careful as he's, as, as he's advertised, as you see in some of these quotes. Um, now, getting to what they actually think of the war, uh, the reporter has this quote, McCrestle may have sold President Obama on, the count on counterinsurgency, but many of his own men aren't buying it. So if they're not buying it, who is, right? It's their idea in the first place. Um, and here's another top eight, senior advisor of McChrystal. He says, quote, if America's pulled back and started paying attention to this war, it would become even less popular. So who believes in this war? See, this issue isn't just about some commander and some drama, and is he going to get fired or is he not going to get fired? This is about, is this war winnable? And as you read the article, it doesn't believe, it doesn't appear that anybody thinks it's winnable. winnable. And then you go, what the hell are we doing there? And um, let me give you the final quote of the article. Okay, now this is the reporter, not anybody on McChrystal's team. But after covering them for a long, long time, this is his conclusion. He says, so far, counterinsurgency has succeeded only in creating a never-ending demand for the primary products supplied by the military, perpetual war. There is, reason, there is a reason that President Obama studiously avoids using the word victory when he talks about Afghanistan. Winning, it would seem, is not really possible, not even with Stanley McChrystal in charge. So he gives you a sense that the guy really admires Stanley McChrystal. Earlier, 
he talked to God, he, he has overflowing praise for him in so many ways throughout the article. He says uh, he only eats one meal a day, and he only sleeps four hours a day. To me, I'm like, dude, get some sleep, man. Maybe you'll make better decisions, right? And get some food in you. I think, you know, I know what happens when I'm hungry. I, you know, I can't concentrate. I want you to be able to concentrate. That doesn't prove to me that you're a tough guy. It proves to me that you're a little silly, to be honest. And, but, but the writer bought into it, you know, and, and, and he says, oh, and his brilliance, even though he didn't finish at the top of his class at West Point at all, he was kind of somewhere in the middle, he had a lot of demerits, sounded like John McCain, right? Anyway, uh, he says, but one of the examples of his brilliance is he gets uh, some briefings on his iPod. Wow, brilliant. And he listens to books on tape. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. I'm not convinced of the brilliance. Okay. So uh, he says, and the uh, final conclusion, like I said, is even with the legendary McChrystalline charge with his nunchuck, it doesn't appear that anybody thinks we can win in Afghanistan. Well, now it appears also that the legendary McChrystal is probably not going to be in charge for very long. Man, final note on this, then we got to move on because there's so many other stories. If Obama doesn't fire him today or tomorrow, uh, it would be profound and literally unbelievable weakness. Like, I, li I couldn't, if that came across the wire, I wouldn't believe it. I'd have to read the story and say, no, there must have been a mistake. He, he's been put in a situation where it is absolutely clear. You don't have a choice. <sighs> Please, for the love of God, do the right thing. Okay. I I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm gonna Let's see how it turns out, okay? Let's, uh, all right, we'll see if we get news the rest of the show. Come back, we'll do more other stories. All right, back on the young Kirks. Now, let's have a little bit of fun, okay? Let's open it up. I got serious issues, but uh, first, uh, goofiness. If you're going to go to goofiness, where are you going to go? Come on, Glenn Beck, obviously. So Glenn Beck has a brilliant analogy uh, between Obama and the World Cup. This ought to be good. Clip number six. You know what, may I say? That Barack Obama's policies are the World Cup. <laughs> it is, uh, the, the, their policies, his policies are the, uh, is the World Cup, if you will. Um, they are the World Cup uh, of uh, political thought. How? It doesn't matter how you try to sell it to us. It doesn't matter how many celebrities you get. It doesn't matter how many bars open early. It doesn't matter how many beer commercials they run. We don't want the World Cup. We don't like the World Cup. We don't like soccer. We want nothing to do with it. You can package it any way you want. You can spend all kinds of money. You can force it on our television sets. We will not... Enjoy the World Cup. <laughs> well, we're the only ones. The rest of the, the world. rest of the world <laughs> likes Barack Obama's policies. We do not, and I'm cool with that. If you want Barack Obama's policies or the World Cup in your country, have at it. I don't hate you. I don't. I don't understand you, but I don't hate you. And if that's what you want to do, and it's. May I go one more thing? Uh, probably not. But probably, go ahead. It's, it's usually <laughs> yeah. that one last thing that gets is. me in trouble. Yeah. Those who like the World Cup, have you noticed they're the most likely to riot in the stands? There are a lot yes. of soccer riots yes. in the stands. Yes. 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 If you Stampedes, like, we talked about if you like day. golf right. or baseball, I haven't seen oh. the baseball how riots. Many, how many baseball stampedes have there been? I, I don't know. Very few. Very few. Yeah. Very few. Yeah. But the the soccer thing, I hate it so much. Probably because the rest of the world likes it so much, and they riot over it, mm -hmm. and it they continually try to jam it All down our throat every mm -hmm. single time the World Cup happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to Barack Obama <laughs> and his policies that will have as much success as the World Cup in, Amer in America. <laughs> in, yes, America. in America. In America, right. Yeah. Right. Um, those rioting soccer fans. Uh, but luckily, uh, good old America sports, there's no riots after our games. Like after the Lakers won the... 
hey, wait a minute. <laughs> and look, have there been riots after soccer games throughout the world? There have been at different instances. Is it an epidemic? Of course not. Is it more than our sports? No, right? And within the U.S., I'm going to rank soccer fans as the least likely to riot. Okay, come on. Anyway, so he hates the World Cup. He hates everybody who watches the World Cup. But luckily, it's not working in the U.S., I'll tell you that. Uh, best ratings ever for this World Cup in the United States. But as usual, Glenn Beck, not really familiar with what's going on in the country. Him and his idiot buddies, they don't like, like soccer. Yeah, <laughs> Obama. That's Glenn Beck for you. Now, look, I got my issues with the World Cup. <laughs> and I've got my own goofy theories on it, including let's make the goals a little larger, a little larger, a little more scoring. Not a lot, just a little, okay? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but I don't think that everybody who watches soccer is stupid or riots or is a liberal. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, uh, that's a little bit of fun for you. So now let's uh, continue the, uh, the fun train. Uh, let's go to Michael Steele. He's going to be on CNBC with Aaron Burnett and uh, Mike, uh, Mark Haynes. Uh, and I'm really surprised with which direction Mark Haynes took this. So let's watch. Uh, George Bush created a lot of jobs. I think there were jobs created in the, in the eight years that George Bush was... Uh, no, well, we can pull up those numbers. And well, I can pull up some numbers, too. So I'll put my numbers against your numbers, and we'll see where uh, we find out. I think, the, I think the jobs were created. I'm almost, almost confident okay. of that. Did, so, so the Lehman blow up and all that—that that didn't happen on Bush's that, watch. That, I'm not, no, it's not. Now you switch. Now you're John. No, you're to talking the, about the you've markets. Got, you've the gone markets, to the end of the term the now. The markets so you're, gonna, so you're now at the end of the term, and there were a whole well, lot of. That doesn't count. It does count. He Look. was still in town. Okay, take your rose-colored glasses off, all right, and look at what I'm really happened. At, the question is, and you asked a good question: What's the plan? Yes. And, and the plan is, I'd much rather take the billions of dollars that we're spending on government intrusion into the markets and turn it over to the capitalists, the entrepreneurs, and the risk takers out there we to tried do that. their thing. No, we didn't. We, we, Look, we, we, and, we, and we we've been successful this, doing we that. We tried this unfettered capitalism that you're preaching. I'm not saying unfettered. We wound up I'm not preaching unfettered We wound up with a disaster. Look, Let me just finish my point. Yeah. We wound up with a disaster on Wall Street, a disaster in the Gulf, thanks to no regulation from MMS during the Bush years. Wait we a minute. tried all Wait a minute. This administration it's signed off on that. This administration oh, no signed question. off on that. So don't start doing the no, Bush administration. No, no question. You guys, you guys. You, you, no question. Look, can Obama. We, can we look from where we are and go forward? I mean, the past. I, I, is the you past. must be used to like buying time and and, and speaking uh, without interruption. Look, I'm really surprised with uh, Mark Haynes there, because I mean that's CNBC saying they're against unfettered capitalism and that we tried that and it didn't work. I was like, whoa. Okay, great, fantastic. They did a very good job of uh, pressuring Steele on a couple of those issues. First, Aaron Burnett's question is good. So what's your alternative? What's the plan? And Michael Steele's plan is, well, instead of doing stimulus as Obama did, we just take it and we just give it to the capitalists. <laughs> First of all, that's not a plan. That's ridiculous. Second of all, unfortunately, that is what we did. We took all the money and we gave it to the banks. How did that work out for us? And that was done under Bush and then continued under Obama. And it's been a disaster. They haven't lent out that money. They just took it home in bonuses. And But that's the Republican philosophy. There it is. No, no, no. Dude, don't get government involved. Just take all the money and just give it to the cap capitalists. Okay? Which is the people that pay the Republican Party's bills. So, and he, I don't understand what he was saying about how Haynes has rose-colored glasses on. He didn't sound like he had any rose-colored glasses on. And then let's get to the issue of jobs, right? Uh, Steele says, I'm almost confident that Bush created jobs. That's when you knew he had no idea. <laughs> okay, almost confident of that? So here are the real numbers, and I know them. Now, uh, Bush, you got to give him credit, and Steele credit here. He did create jobs. Uh, at the end of his eight years, he had created one million jobs. Now, if you took the first six months of Obama administration also into account, he would have lost many millions of jobs. Okay. Uh, and it's not like Obama did that. That was obviously the fallout from the Bush debacle. But all right, you know what? No, no, no. Don't let's be more, more than fair to Bush and say you don't count that, right? So Bush created a million jobs. Um, all right. Well, uh, is that a good or a bad number? I mean, let's look at it relatively. 
uh, Bill Clinton created, uh, must have been around one million, right? No, a little more, uh, two, no, wow, three million? No, that would be tripling Bush's numbers. No, it can't be three million. Two, five million? No, ten million? No, come on, that would be ten times Bush. No way, no. Twenty million? What do you think? Oh, no, it can't be more than twenty million, right? Oh, my God. It turns out Bill Clinton created 23 million jobs in the same eight-year period. Bush, one million, if you're being kind to him and not counting all the jobs that fell off a cliff right after he got out of office, as he was getting out of office. All right. But look, that's not fair because Bill Clinton's a very successful president, right? Uh, so let's create, compare him to uh, an unsuccessful president on the Democratic side because everybody says, oh, Jimmy Carter, what a disaster, stagflation, idiot, didn't know what he was doing. So how many jobs did uh, Jimmy Carter create in just four years, in half the time that Bush did? Well, he couldn't have created a million jobs. That Come on, he was such a loser, right? Two million? No, that'd be twice Bush in half the time. Can't be two million. Three million. Five million? No? No? How about ten and a half million? Carter created ten and a half million jobs. In four years, Bush created one million, if you're being kind, in eight years. Okay, but Steele is almost confident that Bush was great at creating jobs. That if we just do unfettered capitalism, just take all the money and give it to the capitalists, i.e. the rich people, the CEOs, the executives that pay the Republican Party, everything will be just fine, except for all the facts that indicate that's not what happened at all. All right. Now, uh, I go on from Steele to uh, other clown Republicans. So we've got this issue of the uh, unemployment uh, benefits. Are they going to cut them off? Are they not going to? There's uh, battles back and forth. And some Republicans are, are being bold and saying, that's it. We shouldn't give any more. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an, I think that's an interesting debate. I, you know, some liberals would say, oh, that's unbelievable, et cetera, and they're so cruel and cold-hearted. Well, I, I think there, there is a limit to it. I mean, we can't give unemployment for 20 years. We can't give it for 10 years. I don't think we can give it for five years. So the question is, where do you draw the line, right? Uh, now, apparently, Rand Paul uh, draws it at a different place than I would. Uh, here's a direct quote from him. Of course, he's running for Senate in Kentucky. Uh, for the Republicans, he says, as bad as, it, as bad as it sounds, ultimately, we do have to sometimes accept a wage that's less than we had at our previous job in order to get back to work and allow the economy to get started again. Nobody likes that, but it might be one of the tough love things that has to happen. In other words, just calm down, take a lower salary, and stop your complaining. And get off an plane. Now, look, again, some liberals go nuts over that, and they cruel, cold-hearted, etc. I'm somewhere in between on that. Look, are there some people on unemployment who could get uh, a lower paying job and move on? Yeah, of course. Uh, some, no question about it. Okay. Now, understand though the ramifications of that. If you were on a career track where you were making $75,000 a year, but now in order to get a job, you have to take a job at $55,000 a year, they're not going to bring you back up to seventy-five. After all those years, you restart at fifty-five and got to work your way up. Now, that's devastating. So I get why even the small amount of people or a medium-sized amount of people in that category, why they don't want to jump to, okay, all right, I'll take the lower-paying job, Rand Paul, you got it. And you know what we didn't require is for the banks and the bankers who caused this mess to take a lower salary. Now they're taking higher salary than they were before, even though they're the ones that caused the mess. So they get all the money, and the Republicans have no complaints about that. Okay? Rand Paul would claim that he has complaints about it, and some Republicans would. But what have they done? They've done nothing to stop it. In fact, they couldn't wait to give them the money. And they say, oh, we have to protect BP, and, we, and right now in the middle of the reform, we have to protect the banks and let unfettered capitalism happen, et cetera. Right? So for these Republicans, those guys making more money, that's not a problem. Well, if you're unemployed, come on now, just hurry up and take the lower paying job. I don't think it's that simple on either side. Now, to add insult to injury, we go to Orrin Hatch. This is where I don't think it's an open question. Orrin Hatch has an idea too for about, about the unemployed. He wants to do drug testing. Now why would that even occur to someone, right? It occurs to them because they think oh, these unemployed, they're bums, they're losers, they're druggies. Why don't they just know your role, okay? Just to take a lower paying job, you drug addict, right? Are there some unemployed people in the country who are on drugs? Of course there are. Are there people who are employed who are on drugs? Of course there are, right? But is that the main problem with unemployment? Is that who, 
Who thinks that's the main problem? These Republicans who don't know any of these people. They don't know any real people. Everyone they know is fabulously wealthy and funnels that money to them, right? So they think, well, if you're out of a job, I guess you're a bum. But they don't think, hey, wait a minute, it was my president with all the legislation that I voted for that caused this recession in the first place, that caused us to lose 8 million jobs, that maybe wasn't their fault. Maybe it was your fault, Orrin Hatch. The people we should drug test is people like you. What were you on when you agreed to let Bush destroy our economy? When you thought it was a brilliant idea to give gigantic tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans, let them just take that money home, deregulate all of industry, let them take any risk they like, take that money home, and then crash the economy. What were you smoking, Orrin? I want to know what kind of drugs you were on. Now, when actually somebody asked them that. They said, do you think that Congress should be, uh, uh, have these laws applied to them? He said, well, I don't see how that's relevant. <laughs> I suppose so, but come on. No, drugs are for people who are unemployed. And by the way, when you do the drug testing, what does it turn out? It, because they've done it before. In a great majority of the cases, it just turns up marijuana. Okay, and, and marijuana stays in the system longer. It's more, e it's easier to detect. So what are you going to do? Okay, you're going to say, ah, ah, "We got you, we got you, we'll smoke pot." By the way, how different is pot than drinking alcohol? What, so we're not allowed. Should we not let them drink either? Okay, uh, you're unemployed. You don't get to do anything. Okay. And if you do, that's it, we cut off your unemployment. Are they not merciful? If you really want to help these people, it's not, you know, it, giving them the unemployment check is, is, of course, very important, but not even the core issue. The core issue is, next time, learn from your mistakes. You're the ones that caused this mess. And you did it because you think government has no role, and the best thing to do is give all the money to the richest people in America and hope that they voluntarily do the right thing and that they don't get greedy. That's a stupid, disastrous policy. And the only way you came up with it is that because you either were high or you profited off of it. And we know which one it was. And maybe both. Young Turks.